real surprise, surprise. <laughs> you probably didn't expect to see me up here today, but uh, uh, Pastor Reese has uh, got still some issues as he had a little bit last week with the virus that's not horrible, but it's something that he thought he better not spread around. And in addition to that, as some of you probably know, Eileen has had a procedure in the hospital this week, and she's still recovering from that. We hope that will long-term give her a lot of relief from some of the pain she's been suffering. So uh, for those reasons, uh, I was asked as of yesterday to uh, take the service, and I'm very happy to do that. Uh, it's something that, that I enjoy, and I hope it won't be too burdensome for you folks. Uh, the announcements are such today as far as meetings that it might be easier to just tell you who's not meeting today. <laughs> You see them all there in the bulletin, and uh, I'll just run through quick. The finance team will meet uh, right after church. The nominations committee will meet at 3 o'clock. PPR will meet at 4 o'clock. Kids, kids will meet at 5 o'clock along with the youth group. Uh, is that it? Are there any other meetings? This, uh, I think that's enough. But, uh, keep, huh? keep looking. Well, oh, keep looking. Long. Okay. <laughs> uh, Oh, yes, there's a meeting at 5.30 to talk about the Mountain Festival. So uh, if you are involved or should be involved or want to be involved or want to be at the meeting so that someone else doesn't nominate you when you didn't want to be involved, <laughs> then uh, you need to take note of all those meetings and be sure that uh, you're uh, in the one that's appropriate for you, for your particular group. It's exciting to see all the stuff that's going on in our in our church. Um, and, of course, there's an ongoing thing, such as the men's Bible study at the Parsonage Monday night, the ladies' prayer group in the conference room, also on Monday night. Both of these meetings are at 630. Um, there is a new uh, Zoom meeting, which has begun, and last week we had uh, about 10 participants. But, you know, the nice thing about Zoom you can have three people or you can have 300 people. It doesn't, uh, doesn't matter because uh, they're not all in one physical room. They're all spread all over the place. So if you know of someone who would like to participate in our online Zoom meeting, and I particularly direct this to our people who are online uh, watching, we would love to have some of you uh, join us. And if you would like to do that, there'll be information provided a little later in the service about how you can do that. Or you can ask... Uh, uh, someone uh, or go on the website and learn how to be part of that Zoom meeting. The Zoom, at the Zoom meeting, we do the same thing we do at our men's Bible study, and that is we talk about the homework. And everybody does the homework, right? But sometimes people need help with their homework. Uh, or you learn something in doing the homework that you want to share. So these are all opportunities for us to uh, get a jump on what uh, Reese will be talking about next next Sunday because the homework are, are scriptures that are related to that. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, next Sunday is Membership Sunday, and so if you are considering church membership, please notice notify Pastor Reese or Ruth. Uh, church directory photos are continuing to be taken in the fellowship hall for two hours after church. And that's next Sunday, I guess, is not doing that this Sunday. Is that right? Okay. Uh, so if you uh, would like for your picture to be in the church directory, or I should say if you would like to have some control over which picture of you is in the church directory, <laughs> then you might want to uh, take advantage of that next Sunday. Uh, and church council will meet next Sunday also at 3.30 p.m. Uh, the Stanley Sunday School class is going to begin a study of the cost of discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And so we would, we'll probably be passing out the books next week and beginning that. And so it'd be a good time for you to think about whether you want to be involved in an adult Sunday School class. Uh, I know that many of you are involved in, in other classes, and that's wonderful. We're not trying to take away any, anybody from any other class, but if you're not presently involved in an adult Sunday school class, please consider that. And uh, if uh, Reese were here, he would certainly remind you to keep your bulletins and use the prayer list as part of your regular prayer discipline. So I will echo that as well. Uh, scheduling. 
of church facilities needs to be requested by calling the number that's given there. And the yellow cards are for visitor contact information. Do uh, we need to hear any more about that? About the yellow cards? Do you want to comment on that? Or is... I sure will. Good morning. Welcome to the visitors. Uh, we got yellow cards in the pews if you would fill those out so we can get your contact information and uh, know how to get a hold of you and tell you about our ministries. Okay, great. And the blue cards in the pews are for prayer requests, and they will be collected at the time of the offering brought here, and they will be prayed for not only this morning in our service, but also uh, throughout the coming days and uh, included in our list of prayer requests. And uh, I believe we have another announcement. Oh, yeah. The Methodist women will meet Tuesday, uh, September the 10th at 1030 a.m. Okay, Methodist Women Tuesday, 10.30. Right, in the fellowship. In the fellowship hall, okay. And that's another group. If you're not a part of that, you might want to consider becoming a part of that. All right. Uh, do we have any birthdays today, this week? Not just today, but this week. I see somebody coming forward. And how old are you, dear? How old are you? Five. Five. That, that's, that's digital, by the way. When you tell your age by holding that fingers, that's usually, this, this gal is with it. She's moved into the digital era. different call to worship than the one printed in the bulletin, but this one is one of the uh, readings that's assigned for this week, and this was part of your homework. Uh, a reading from Proverbs, selected verses in chapter 22. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is maker of them all. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of anger will fail. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. Do not rob the poor because they are poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord pleads their cause, and despoils the life of those who despoil them. Our opening hymn is number 57.
please remain standing and turn with me to page 810, uh, where we will read together, or responsively, Psalm 91. It continues on page 811. Those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God and my trust. For the Lord will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions. Under the Lord's wings you will find refuge. God's faithfulness is a shield and love. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your habitation. No evil shall befall you. For God will give his angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up on their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample on your foot. Because they cleave to me in love, I will deliver them. I will protect them. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. I will satisfy them with long life and show them my salvation. The Apostles' Creed is found on page 881. Let us join in affirming our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us greet one another in the name of the Lord. Uh, may the peace of the Lord be with you all.
the time of offering is not just a time for collecting money. Did you know that? That's why we call this an offering. We could call it a collection if it were just about money. But it's a time when we offer ourselves to the Lord. And uh, we express that oftentimes by putting money in the plate. But uh, as this plate is passing by, uh, I would invite each of you to think about what God has done for you and how you offer yourself to Him as a living sacrifice uh, to worship Him in the way that uh, is worthy of all He's done for us. Let us pray. Our Father, you have done for us far beyond we could ever ask or think. Move our hearts to offer ourselves to you in return. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
I've got to say, Judy, that a couple of weeks ago, I was in Walmart, and as we were trying to check out, John had forgotten, or he had a thing of ice cream, but it was broken, so he had to go back and get a new one. And while he was gone, I said to the cashier, we can just check out and he can do later. She said, no, no, it's okay. And the line started building behind us and she started singing that song. So I joined her and we, <laughs> we sang that song while all the people waited. <laughs> and then John came with the ice cream and we checked out. <laughs> Beautiful song. Uh, recently, John and I have taken up the, the habit of coming to the sanctuary during the week, and John plays the piano, and I sit and pray. And it's a wonderful time of communion with the Lord. So you should stop as you're passing by and try it for yourself. And this morning we get an opportunity to talk about the the joys and, and, the, and the request. And Angie says, remember my Aunt Donna Wright, in a two week period she had shoulder surgery, then she fell and broke her ankle. So see, she had surgery on that as well. Clara asks prayer for the school shooting victims and the shooter, as well as her friend Olivia. Continue to pray for my Aunt Marlene Miller in Siskin rehab for a broken leg. She's now at Erlanger with COVID. Brenda's aunt. Andrea Hank fighting her third cancer. And Audrey and unborn Freya due in October. And then this joy. Drennan Everett was accepted into the pharmacy school at University of Georgia. So please join me now in a precious time in prayer for these needs and for these joys. Let us pray. Father God, we hardly know how to pray, but we lift these cards up to you and ask that you make sense of them and of us. And may we, as the song says, may we seek your face. May we believe your word and trust your grace and cast on you our every care. And bless us as we join in your prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. I will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
first reading this morning is from James 2, verses 1 through 17 from the Christian Standard Bible. My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in your glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if someone comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor person dressed in filthy clothes also comes in, if you look with favor on the one wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here in a good place, and yet, and yet you say to the poor person, stand over there, or sit here on the floor by my footstool, haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he promised to those who love him? Yet you have dishonored the poor. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into court? Don't they blaspheme the good name that was invoked over you? Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. If, however, you show favoritism, you commit sin or are convicted by law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the entire law yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he, said, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you are a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has, shown, who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? If a brother or sister without, is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you who says to them, Go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, <coughs> what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. <coughs> Mark 7, verses 24 through 37. He got up and departed from the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, but he could not escape notice. Instead, immediately after hearing about him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she was asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, because isn't it right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dog? Because it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to, to, to the dogs. But she replied to him, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, Because of this reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. When she went back to her home, she found her child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. Again, leaving the region of Tyre, he went by way of Sidon to the Sea of Galilee through the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had difficulty speaking and begged Jesus to lay his hand on him. So he took him away from the crowd in private. After putting his fingers in the man's ears and spitting, he touched his tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed deeply and said, Epapha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak clearly. He ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more they proclaimed him. They were extremely astonished and said, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As those of you who've been paying attention may remember, Pastor Reese has been bringing us a series uh, on the, uh, the armor of God as found in the book of Ephesians. And uh, we were expecting to hear more of that, uh, that series today, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I don't want to attempt to uh, bring you the message that he hopefully will continue when he does come back next week. Uh, we hope it will be next week. Uh, and so I'm reverting back to the lessons that are in the lectionary for today, which are also, by the way, the lessons which are in your homework. 
And we know that everybody does the homework, right? It's, it's written right there, at the bottom of your bulletin. And if you do, if you read those scriptures, you will, in almost every case, know what the preacher will be preaching about the following Sunday. Those verses are also verses that we uh, study in our men's Bible study on Monday night and also look at in our Zoom Bible study on Tuesday night. And for that reason, I have been looking at those passages. Uh, and so it was much easier for me to preach a sermon on those passages rather than try to guess what Reese might have been going to talk about if he had continued his, his series. So we will look at those passages, and I want to uh, take a few moments for us to think about uh, what those passages are telling us uh, uh, about the kingdom of God and during this time uh, of the church year, uh, how we should be living a life that is in keeping with that principles, principles of the kingdom. Uh, and so I want to read again four verses from the James passage, and then I will make some comments about that. James 2, 1 through 4. My brothers and sisters, do not claim the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory while showing partiality. For if a person with gold rings and fine clothes come into your assembly, and a poor person in dirty clothes comes also in, if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here at a good place, Please, while the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with, with evil thoughts? Wow. I'm going to emulate our pastor a little bit in that. At least he says wow a lot, right? So wow, as Pastor Reese would say. There was prejudice in the early church. Can you imagine that? I don't think James would have written these verses unless there was a need for it. Sometimes people think that the early church was perfect. And they say, oh, if we could only be like it was in the early church. And yes, there were some ways in which the early church was great and a great example for us. But if you read the New Testament letters, you find that just like us, they had some problems in the early church. The church of Corinth actually was a real mess. As you read Paul's letters to that church, you find that he's dealing with one issue after another that had come up in that church. And uh, uh, I'm amazed that the people that received that letter in Corinth uh, uh, let it become part of our scripture. I think they would have done, done well to have, have, have burned that letter because it doesn't show them in a very good light. Uh, and so there were messy problems in Corinth and we're glad that we have received that letter so that we can learn from their mistakes, shall we say. Now, the book of James was a general epistle. That means it was a, an epistle that was written, a letter that was written not to one particular church, but to many churches. In other words, it was written to be taken to a number of different churches and read. And the fact that James felt the need to address this question of prejudice in the church, uh, to me says that it must have been something that had occurred in several churches at least and probably was fairly widespread. And so uh, we can assume that there was this problem in, the early, in, in early churches. Now why should that surprise us? Because uh, that sort of prejudice is found in churches today. Churches are made up of people like you and me. And so what our faults are is sometimes reflected in the congregations. I don't think that's a huge problem in our church, in this local church, but it's something we must always be on guard against. James is talking about one particular type of prejudice, which you might call class prejudice. That is favoring rich people over poor. Rich folks are sometimes called the upper class and poor folks the lower class. And many churches are composed of people generally from one particular economic class. And that's okay. It's not necessarily a problem. Unless, of course, those people think that if someone from a different social class shows up, that they can't be part of their fellowship. Christianity has no place in it for a caste system. I think you all know what the caste system is. It's something that's found in India. And actually it's based on their Hindu beliefs. 
People are born into a higher or lower caste based on their previous life. When we were in India, we went to some meetings from time to time. And I remember one of the meetings we went to, and we went, it was held in a tent. I can't remember. It was a dedication of some kind of a building or something. So we went in there, and in the room was uh, at the very front of the area where people were seated were these big plush chairs. Not exactly straddle loungers, but, but I mean fancy, fancy chairs with leather upholstery and all that. Very padded, lovely chairs. And then just below that was, just behind that was a row of fairly ordinary but nice chairs. And behind that was a row of rather scruffy looking folding chairs. And then behind that was an area of first standing room. And as people came in, they seemed to know which set of chairs they were supposed to sit in. Now that's, that to us was a graphic illustration of the caste system. The extreme stratification and, and the belief that we are not all created equal. Uh, you know, Mahatma Gandhi was a great reformer in India. We've all heard of him. And one of the things that he wanted to do away with as a reformer, social reformer, was the caste system. Uh, Hal mentioned in our uh, Bible study Monday night a story that I'd heard before but had kind of forgotten about that when, when Gandhi was actually a student probably in England, he was studying law, became a very educated man, by the way. Uh, he, he studied Christianity and he realized that Christianity had the answer to the caste system. And so he decided that he would attend a Christian church and learn more about the gospel and Christianity so that he could take it back to India and help to uh, destroy this system of caste discrimination that existed there. So he went to a church on a given Sunday morning and uh, being uh, a man of somewhat darker skin, he uh, went into the door and was met by an usher who told him, uh, you need to go and worship with your own kind. That was a tragedy because if that had not occurred, if, that, if those people in that church had not shown that race discrimination or prejudice, Gandhi might well have been a Christian. And what a Christian he would have been. That terrible snub, snub with its devastating consequences was based more on skin color than on financial status because Gandhi was not a poor man. He was able to, to, to go to, in, to uh, England and, and study the law. But pe prejudice can be based on many different things and in all of its forms, it's being proud of who we are as opposed to who others are and it can take many forms. James goes on to mention the dangers of uh, recruiting only the upper class as a way to grow a church. <laughs> he says, listen, beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor person. Is, not the rich, is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, apparently, rich folks were actually not the cornerstone of the New Testament church. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, See how many among you there are. See how there are not many among you who are wise, mighty, or noble. The uh, Corinthian church and most of the New Testament church was made up from the lower classes. But apparently there were some who felt that if we could only just recruit these, these, uh, these uh, high class people in our church, it would be a great thing. We once had a missions consultant who came to Ecuador and told the missionaries there how we had gotten it all wrong. We had worked with the lower classes where, as we should have worked with the rich. He said, if you would only win the rich people in this culture to Christ, then they would in turn influence everyone else and it would all be a great success. Well, we can say that in our time in Ecuador, it was the despised lower classes who were the most responsible to the gospel. We worked, uh, our radio station broadcast many programs to the so-called Indians 
course, they're not from India. You know that how that goes. But the indigenous peoples of South America, they were actually called Quichuas. And they were the people who were responding to the gospel in great numbers. In the same way in India itself, the uh, largest numbers of Christians are from the lower classes and the lower castes. Uh, among the tribal peoples in the northeast corner of the country. Now, to be sure, there are many fine, upper-class, wealthy, and educated Indian Christians. Uh, one of them was a wonderful lady who Ruth and I say arranged our marriage. You know, that's, that's what they do in India. It was actually, this took place in New York where she was serving at a school where we were. By the way, that lady's last name was Caleb. We have a young man with us this morning whose middle name is Caleb. That's our son, Andrew, who uh, we named after this dear lady because she had meant so much to us. So there are, there are rich Christians who are wonderful, wonderful people. But uh, most of us are not that. We're just ordinary folks. And hopefully, hopefully we will never think that we, there's anyone we need to look down on, nor should we be ashamed that other people might be willing to look down on us. Now, our story from the gospel picks up a, somewhat on the same theme. And I want to read that story for you again because uh, even though we heard it read very beautifully already, I, uh, this is such a story. I love this story. So the first part of that, of that gospel reading, I'm going to read again. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. That sounds pretty tough, doesn't it? But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And when she went home, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. I love this story. Even though at first glance, it may seem this story is telling us that Jesus himself suffered a little bit from racial pride. We're told that this woman was not a Jew, but a Gentile. Actually, it says she was a Syrophoenician, uh, which refers to her ethnicity. In Matthew's account, he calls her a Canaanite, which refers more to the geographical area, but it's the same, same thing, same person. In any case, this woman was definitely not a Jew. She did not live in Judea. And Jesus used some rather colorful, strong language to uh, tell her that she was not the one to whom he was ministering at that particular time. I heard a sermon recently where someone uh, interpreted this story to say that Jesus, as a Jew, was a bigot, was a racist, until this woman made him realize that uh, his upbringing had made him go wrong, and so he then changed his attitude. And the point the preacher was making is that even if Jesus had to learn to get over his prejudices against other groups that he had despised, we should also make an effort in that direction. Uh, I remember that I had heard that exact same sermon preached 30 years earlier in the South American context. So apparently that interpretation of this passage has made its rounds. It probably appeals to those for whom the Bible is mainly a source book for their somewhat truncated gospel. That is a gospel that's concerned only about human relations and nothing about our relationship with God. The huge problem with that interpretation of this passage is this. If Jesus was a racist, even for a short time, and if we know that racism is a sin, then Jesus was a sinner. Friends, if Jesus was a sinner, we're all in deep, deep trouble. Because Paul tells us that God made Jesus, who was without sin, to be made sin for us so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. That 
is theologically referred to as substitutionary atonement. That means to say that Christ, who was the perfect righteous person, transfers his righteousness to us who believe and takes upon himself our unrighteousness and bears it to the cross where it is judged by God and rightfully so. Now, if Christ was not indeed perfect, if he was a sinner, the whole plan of salvation is ruined. And yet we know that Jesus was not a sinner because he said, which of you can convince me of sin or accuse me of sin? And all throughout the New Testament, Jesus is proclaimed and presented to us as the one, the only one, the only human being who's ever lived a sinless life. And so this understanding, this, this concept that somehow Jesus was saying something hateful and ugly to this woman, that's out of court. But what is going on here? Was it a sin for Jesus to say that he was at this point of his ministry only ministering to the Jews? No, because that was God's plan from the beginning. God's plan had always been to choose the Jews. Now that seems like discrimination, seems like prejudice, but God's plan was to choose the Jews so that they would be his messengers to take his love and forgiveness to the whole world and call all of us, us Gentiles, us guys, to repentance and salvation. This is found many places in the Old Testament. Perhaps the place that I love the most where it's talked about is in the book of Jonah. You know, Jonah was a Jewish prophet. And he was told by God, go and preach to this Gentile city, the city of Nineveh. They're a terrible, wicked city. They need to be told uh, that I'm bringing judgment upon them unless they repent. And so Jonah was sent there, but you know he didn't want to go. Took a little, you know, that whole whale thing was all about saying, hey, you're going to go whether you like it or not. I'm sending you, and you're going to go one way or another. And so Jonah went. Now, Jonah was a racist. He was absolutely a racist. He hated the people of Nineveh. And so God had to use a little bit of an unusual method to get him to do what he was supposed to do. And even after he preached and the people of Nineveh repented, <laughs> He sat under a tree and sulked. He was mad because they repented and he, he, they didn't get judged. He wanted them to be judged. He hated them. And so God had to scold him a little bit more. Now, the fact that we even have that book of Jonah tells me that afterwards Jonah must have repented. He either wrote that book or he told somebody else about it and they wrote the book. And, you know, people don't, people don't, tell bad stories on themselves unless they've repented. So <laughs> he must have repented and changed his mind at some point. But Jonah, if, if you want to look for an example of someone who was a racist and then, you know, they repented, we've got Jonah. We don't need to bring Jesus into that story. And, of course, there's one other problem with that, making Jesus the one that had to repent. You know, if Jesus was a racist then God was a racist because Jesus was only doing what his father had told him to do. And that is, take the message first to the Jews. Then they will take it to the Gentiles. That was God's plan. And so that's why Jesus said this, 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 this woman, he said, it's not time for me to, to, to uh, heal your daughter because at this point in my ministry, I'm sent to the Jews. But there's another possible explanation as well that I want to mention. You remember when Jesus was, uh, the, the 5,000 people were there and they were hungry and Jesus was wondering, how, what are we going to do? He said to his disciples, he said, where can we get enough money to buy food for all this mob? And the scripture, the, the, the gospel actually says, this he said testing them for he knew himself what he was going to do. That is to say, Jesus asked that question not because he was wondering, where are we going to get money? It's because he wanted them to realize 
what an amazing thing it was that he was about to do. So he said this to increase their faith. And I believe that's exactly what he's doing with this woman. When he mentioned to her that it was not appropriate at this point to take what belonged to the children and give it to those, well, the dogs, the Gentiles. She responded with this amazing, amazing saying. She said, Lord, and she did say Lord, she did call him Lord. She said, basically, I know that I as a Gentile do not deserve anything from you. You're the Jewish Messiah. But I will accept whatever crumb you will let drop from me. So Jesus, he stepped up the timetable a little bit. He didn't change God's plan. He just kind of jumped ahead a little bit and made the blessing which was soon to be available within a year or two to all the world he made it available to her a little just a little bit ahead of time because he saw how great her faith was because indeed it would only be a, a year maybe a year maybe two years we don't know exactly you know during the three-year ministry of jesus when all these things occurred but we know that very soon jesus the risen jesus would say preach this gospel to all the world Go into all the world and preach the gospel. It is for everyone. It just wasn't at that particular time. But she had the faith to ask for those crumbs. So she got that blessing. She got that blessing and her daughter was healed. But let's think a little bit more about this woman. I found, I found in her a, a, a very amazing combination. On the one hand, she realized that she had no right to demand anything from Jesus. On the other hand, she was willing to just keep asking over and over. She wanted her daughter to be healed. Now, in our day, we have some who insist that being very bold in prayer means that we can demand things from God. We can claim things by right. This name it and claim it type of prayer implies that God is obligated to give us whatever we ask for as long as we know how to push all the right buttons. Uh, some time ago, Ruth was talking to an uncle of hers who had fallen under this type of preaching and she mentioned something about receiving a particular blessing from God which she didn't deserve. And he immediately said, what do you mean you don't deserve it? You're a child of the king. And she replied, yes, but that's the point. I don't deserve to be a child of the king. Jesus tells us that God will hear those who persist in prayer and will grant them good things. There are different ways that God answers our prayer. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's wait. And sometimes it's, do you really know what you're asking? This, this woman knew that she didn't deserve anything from God, but she was willing to ask for the crumbs. For several hundred years, actually since about the mid-1500s, Christians used a prayer uh, that was called the Prayer of Humble Access. It was part of the communion service. We actually used that prayer when I was growing up. I think it probably got changed in about 56, somewhere along in there. It was dropped, and we have other prayers now that we use, which are also wonderful. But I, I, I love that prayer, hum, humble access. Among the other things that it says is, this is us praying before communion. Lord, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Did any of you remember praying that prayer in the communion service years ago? Well, I guess most of you are not quite as old as I am. But that was that was in our communion service. It was in the Methodist hymnal I grew up with, and I wish it were still there. I think that prayer was inspired by the faithful prayer of this Syrophoenician woman. She knew that she was unworthy, and yet she kept asking. I think that's the pattern that God wants for us in prayer. 
not assuming that God has to answer this prayer. He has to give us what we want. We can demand this. We can command that. No. We'll always be unworthy. But God's property is always to have mercy. And we count on that. Jesus warns us that the danger of the danger of being one who mistreats the poor, and by extension anyone we judge to be second class, but the gospel also teaches us that when we think we're being treated as second class by others or even by God, we should not lose heart, but know that in God's purposes we are not forgotten. The way of the kingdom is to continue to ask both God and others for acceptance and dignity not based on our merits, but simply on the basis that God has shown his love for us and that we can gladly receive that love and in turn pass it to others. That's kind of summed up, isn't it, by what James said when he talked about the royal law. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.